Hello, I'm David Thacker, and I was director of the Young Vic from 1983, the end of, to 1993, so nearly 10 years. And for me, one of the most precious things about that was not just that all my four children were born and came into the world when I was director of the Young Vic, which is one reason why the Young Vic will always be so precious to me and special in my um, imagination, but also some of the work that we were able to do, which I think found its highest form of expression for me in the work of Arthur Miller, um, simply because it was possible for those of us who were lucky enough to work with him to work with arguably the greatest living playwright at the time and to get to understand him and understand what his priorities were, how his um, plays worked, and to work closely with him. And I think for any of us who had that opportunity, probably it's been perhaps the most precious things in our professional life. Now, that all started for me when I did a production of The Crucible um, which I was very, very proud of and very happy about. Um, and he didn't see it, but his agent saw it and was quite complimentary. But actually, what really was the starting point was a complete accident, um, as often happens in your life. Something quite unintended turns into something that you weren't expecting at all. And this accident came about like this. Um, I had agreed with Helen Mirren um, to do Hedda Gabler. I was going to direct her in Hedda Gabler. And we had almost certainly programmed it. And um, we then discovered that Hampstead Theatre were also going to be doing Hedda Gabler almost at the same time. And we discussed it a bit. And... Um, she said, I don't think it's very sensible to have a Hedda Gabler competition, do you? And um, so I was terribly disappointed because we both thought, well, they got in marginally before we did. And so the honourable thing was to say, well, we won't do it then. And I thought, what a terrible shame that this great, great actress probably won't work here now because there may not be something that fitted, luckily, into my great... Um, surprise well delight actually she did come and work with us on two other shows in my time there so but at the time it seemed like a real um a really sad thing to have happened but so i was flailing around thinking well what should we do instead what should we do instead and many years earlier corin redgrave who also was very important to this theater in, in my time here because he acted here on a number of occasions um he'd said to me, sometime you really ought to look at Arthur Miller's version of An Enemy of the People. I didn't even know at the time that Arthur Miller had done a version of it, and so I thought, perhaps I'll look at that. And I read it, and it um, struck me as being an utterly fantastic play. Um, and so I approached um, his agent and um, to see whether we could do it. And he was very, very cautious about it because it hadn't been done in London ever and had only had one production, I think, in, in England, which, um, ironically for me, because I'm now the director of the Optican Theatre Bolton, um, was at the Optican Theatre Bolton. Um, but he was a bit careful about it and... He said, Who's, who will be playing the lead role in it? And um, this is all via the agent. And I said, eventually, I got Tom Wilkinson, who wasn't a film star at the time, but was a, a fantastic actor and highly regarded by those who had been lucky to work with him. And I'd worked with him on Ghosts with um, Vanessa Redgrave. And his agent was able to say, oh, he's the guy who I saw in Ghosts. And also she was able to refer to the production of the, the Crucible. So he agreed to let us have the rights to do it. That's how I started on the adventure. And then I began to work closely on the play and I read Ibsen's original play to compare and contrast. And this is 
not um, this my next um, statement certainly won't be agreed with by Michael Billington I know that for certain but um, I think a lot of people would agree with me that Arthur Miller's play is much much better than Ibsen's original play uh, now that could take a lot of debating but um, but what I felt when I read the original play clearly in translation was that um, there had been certain changes that he'd made that I wasn't quite sure were right. But most important for me, um, I was grappling with this question, what do you do when the play is, his version of the play has a very, very strong American slang vernacular? Um, and I was thinking, well, you can't really do it in American accents if you're setting it in, if it, the play's taking place in Norway, which it is, um, and it would be a bit bizarre and peculiar doing an Ibsen play, as it were, in period, set in Norway with American accents. It seemed a bit odd. Um, and so I spoke to the, his agent and said, would it be possible to uh, for me to discuss this with Arthur Miller? And, and she said, well, why not phone him up? So... Um, she very kindly arranged for me to phone him and I spoke to him on the telephone um, and put this point to him and he was very surprised that the, that the difference between what he would call English and his English was so marked and I said well for example um, the first few lines of the play are you surey quick Mr Keel you can't say that in English. You know, you can only say that in Amer an American accent. Um, and I then cited other examples, uh, ones that come to mind now. Like, for example, there's a slang line where one of the characters says, this will knock the big bellies into the garbage pan. And I said, he, he did just go... So he said, well, why don't you... Um, just turn the lines into what you think is English, because these were not. This was like the. This would probably be five percent of the dialogue in the play, you know. And if you have any problem, get back to me. Now, maybe amazing and surprising to all you people listening to this that not only did we not have emails or the internet or anything like that didn't exist, nor did we even have um, fax machines at the time um, and so it really wasn't possible to have now it would be dead easy you just email and you'd send a draft and you'd say what about that change it all that stuff so the only way which was to my great good fortune was to speak directly on the telephone and when we got into rehearsal uh, with the actors in the first week of rehearsal we scrutinized very very closely the original Norwegian text with our stage manager at the time, Aaron Haston's daughter, who was Icelandic but had a reasonable grasp of, of Norwegian. So we had the Norwegian text with the English translations that we were using. And um, so we were able to do a really rigorous, thorough analysis of the kind of changes it had made. Now, in the course of this, it confirmed my view that um, he had because the play was written around the time of the Crucible and it was in effect I would say more to do with McCarthyism than the Crucible is in itself in a way and, and, but um, he had turned the central young woman into what then would have been I think a very modern American young woman and it didn't quite sit comfortably with the period in which the play was originally written. And so I remember saying to him, look, there's a couple of speeches I, I think maybe we should consider putting back that you've cut. And he very generously said, well, why don't you try it? Um, which I thought was rather amazing. Um, and try putting it back and see, what, see if it works. Um, and so we did that. I should also say, before we got into this part of the process, um, we spoke at length about casting, and he was incredibly lucid and helpful about the casting, in particularly 
what I learned from this conversation, which kind of stayed with me forever, really, is the fact that all of his plays are written on the basis of trying to give the best possible case to every character that you're creating or writing. So, for example, with um, the the brother, the mayor of of um, um, the central character, um, Stockman, Thomas Stockman, the central character, his brother is a man. Now, if you weren't careful, that could be turned into a kind of anti-capitalist figure or something. It, uh, and and so all that dialogue about casting was whether very enriching and helpful. Anyway, so I had that telephone access throughout the rehearsal period. And then, to my great um, good fortune... The production was very successful, and it transferred to the West End. Now, I then approached him again about the possibility of doing another play, well, two, uh, uh, two plays in a double bill, the double bill which is called Two-Way Mirror. Um, and he was very concerned about the casting of that one, because that had never been done either in England and when it had been done in the States it was it was received very badly in fact directed by him and I came to realize that he was probably not a very good director even though he was incredibly intelligent about his plays self-evidently but um, and certainly when I found him in the rehearsal room I always used to think my god if I was an actor and I was hearing all this, I'd know what to do eventually, but immediately, I mean, not eventually, I would have known immediately how to, I would be able to translate these insights into, but I think what he probably didn't realise as a director was that there's a lot more involved than just telling people what something means, um, and you can get pretty bored pretty quickly if you tell them what it means, and it makes no difference to the way they play it, you know, and a lot of the strategies of directing are to try to unlock a play for actors and unlock in them their capacity to play it which are to do with other skills and just telling them literally what something's about or either a line or anyway but but event i was then able to say and this brings me back to where i was starting with the, the helen mirren sadness i said oh, well helen mirren and bob peck would like to do it he knew of helen mirren and he didn't know Bob Peck, but I told him all about his fantastic work, both on television and at the, the Royal Shakespeare Company. And so as I would say, frankly, we would have here probably two of the very best British actors of the right age that you could get. So I don't think we could do any better. So he said, well, that's great. That's great. And he gave us the rights to do it. Now, as things turned out, coincidentally... Um, the production in the West End corresponded with our rehearsal period. The production of um, An Enemy of the People in the West End and corresponded with our rehearsal period of, of Two Way Mirror. And he decided he'd like to come to see the production in the West End. And I said, well, would you like to spend some time with us in rehearsal? Um, and he said he'd love to. So he came to see the the, the production of the West End and I have to say I was terrified sitting next to him in the audience it was the same night as a semi-gala performance in which Geoffrey Archer who owned the theatre um, was slightly showing off and he had um, this event when he knew Arthur Miller was coming he got some guests in and um, also on that evening we had Michael Foote the former leader of Labour Party, and um, Neil Kinnock watching the show with me, and Arthur. Um, but I was sitting next to Arthur, and I thought, my God, I hope he likes this, because we haven't better pass every change by him. You know, so he sent, effectively, he was watching this English version of it. Um, and it's always terrifying I've always been terrified when a playwright sees anything I've directed you know if they've not been able to be involved in the rehearsals because my main wish as a, as a director is to serve the playwright and to actually express their play as, as well and as richly and as fully and imaginatively as I can so they are the people you most want to like what you're doing and 
Fortunately, he was very, very positive about about the production, and which was a relief because uh, he was we'd planned for him to come to rehearsals the next day, and he came to rehearsals for uh, Two Way Mirror, and I always remember he came into the rehearsal room and he sat very kind of discreetly at the back of the room. And I said, "Now come and sit near and brought the chair," and we were at the time doing this exercise, which is what I sometimes do, well, nearly always do with plays, is to articulate your subtext. A bit like in that Woody Allen film where um, the, the subtitles, I can't remember which film it is, but the subtitles, what they're really thinking, comes on behind what they're saying. Um, and it is sometimes a very, very quick and good way of getting the actors to decide whether what they're actually saying is what they mean or what they're thinking or whether something other is going on than what they're saying. Now, these plays are particularly oblique, or one of them in particular, Elegy of a Lady, is very um, oblique. And so he had to come into this room. So it was a rather challenging day to suddenly have the playwright walk in just about halfway through the recipe because they're all of us therefore actually trying to say what we thought that this play what was going on under the language of this play and he was really fascinated by this he'd never witnessed anything like this before and he's fascinated by it and then in also also in the play there is a psychiatrist who doesn't appear but bob peck had telephone conversation with this psychiatrist you, you only get half of the conversation so i said to arthur look would you mind just being the psychiatrist? And so he did. He started, and then he started playing back the other side of the telephone call. And then I realised what a great actor he was. And um, and it was such fun. And he was so funny hearing him um, just improvise being this psychiatrist talking to Bob Peck on the other side of the telephone. And and anyway, he stayed for a week in these rehearsals. Um, but towards the end of it, I said, look, the problem is that as you know, um, being a director sometimes involves periods of rehearsal which are, in one sense, quite boring if you're not a director. So very often, for example, I know I'm allowing actors to stumble through stuff, they don't quite know the lines, and, and as a director, um, sometimes it's best just to let them be for a bit, you know, and not keep jumping in and saying, oh, this is... Um, and and particularly if they're not if they're struggling with their lines, what's the point of keep saying do it like this, do it like this? Actually, their main concern is I um, don't know my lines well enough or whatever. So um, I said to Arthur, look, um, it would be if we ever do this again, why don't you come at the end of rehearsals when we're really on top of our game, and then your input would be so much more valuable. And so. He said, well, I'd love to do that. So what if you ever do one of my plays again? You know, maybe we could do that. Now, the next play I did in my sequence of Arthur Miller Productions of the Young League was The Price, which also had Bob Peck and had David Calder and Marjorie Yates and um, Alan McNaughton. And very sadly, two of those four have now deceased, Alan McNaughton and Bob Peck. But David Calder, as you know, has been a passionate advocate of this theatre played here with great distinction and has been a wonderful board member for many, many years and has had a major impact on the development of the theatre since his time here as an actor. But at the time, he was just a simple old actor, a young actor, but not, not with any other status in the theatre. But anyway, this is Arthur... When he knew we were doing the prize, it luckily coincided with an exhibition that his wife, Inga Marath, who was a, a wonderful internationally recognised photographer, was having in her native country, Austria. And for a lot of Americans, including Arthur, um, coming to Europe is uh, quite a big deal. But he thought, well, if I'm coming to Europe anyway, go to Austria, I'll come to these rehearsals. So it worked out that he was going to be here for the last week of rehearsals up until the opening of the show and or the first preview anyway and so i said to the actors when I, we knew this was happening right at the beginning of the rehearsal i said look you're going to be completely terrified um 
whenever he sees it, you'll be terrified. So why don't we just do a run for him? And why don't we pace our rehearsal so the very first thing he does is a run? And it will mean that uh, we can deliver it as best we can up to that point, knowing we've got another week's rehearsal, and then we can use his input in a, in, an, in a creative way. And they said, well, that sounds like a good plan. So that's what we did. And so we used to rehearse. I don't know whether the young lady still rehearses, but we used to rehearse in a place called Copperfield Street, 100 yards away, this old church, a wonderful rehearsal room, like you'd expect with the title Copperfield Street. It's got wooden beams and quite old and ancient building. Now, the play takes place in an attic at the top of a house, and there's lots of furniture stored there. The furniture that these two brothers, who haven't met for many, many years, are sorting out because the house, if my memory serves me correctly, is being pulled down. Um, anyway, so in the rehearsal room, and it was done in the round, and so in the rehearsal room we had the mark out in quite a small rehearsal room and all this rehearsal furniture there. And I remember he walked in, ready for this run through, with Inga, and he walked through the door and said, Hey, this is just like the attic. This is just like the attic. It's kind of like weird for him, I think, thinking I've actually kind of walked into a space that feels very like this brownstone house anyway, what this attic would be like. Anyway, we sat him down on the front row, and then the actors played the play for him. And at the end of this, and he sat there, gripped by it, laughing a lot, which is one of the most endearing things about Arthur, that he used to laugh at his own jokes um, more than anybody else, probably. But he just, and he loved it. If actors actually revealed the humour in his plays, it made him very, very happy, because he was an incredibly witty, funny man. Um, and every other line was a wisecrack from him. He's very witty and funny. But anyway, um... So he sat through this, and then he turned to me at the end. He went, he, he went out of the room, and then he came back. He said, "By the way, um, why have you done it without an interval?" I said, "Well, look." And I showed him the script. He said, "Look, in, you have a note at the front of the play that says um, it could be done with an interval, um, but it would be preferable if the production was done in one go without an interval." And he said. Yeah, but I was younger then, and I had a better bladder. <laughs> and so we then, um, I then said, um, so we then had a cup of tea, our coffee break, whatever, and then we sat down around a table, and I said to him, right, tell us what you think. And he was very, to me, very, to begin with, kind of uncertain, like, thinking, have I got to be careful? And I, because I think particularly he hadn't had a lot of good experiences with directors in his time, I think, in the States. Um, apart from the wonderful relationship, of course, with um, Ilya Kazan in his first two productions um, until they fell out. Um, but anyway, um, he was a little tentative. I said, no, come on, look, we really want to know. You'd be as bold as you like, say whatever you like. You know, we don't, we don't want to pussyfoot around here. I'm sure I didn't use that phrase. He probably didn't wouldn't have heard it before but um just tell us straight what you think and he was incredibly simple and lucid i remember him saying what he said well this play has got to be like billiard balls you hit one billiard ball then it bangs into another one and then that goes off in another direction and then you hit another one and it goes off in another direction and he's saying the key to it is that the audience must be thinking i agree i agree with him now now I no i agree with him now I agree with him now. That was like the first thing he said, which is very, very helpful, just in terms of making utterly clear that we were very, very precise about um, the uh, the way each unit of the play, if you like, breaks down. And anyway, he talked a little bit more, and then we asked him questions. And the kind of way he was so helpful for me, always as a director, which I always found him fantastic to work with is you would ask a, a straight question you get a straight answer like for example in this play there's a couple of lines at the end of it where um, the wife played by Marjorie Yates Esther has been bugged 
throughout the play by the fact that um, her, poli- her husband has never made it as a uh, he's just been a cop really and she, he's, he, she really would have wanted him to be a scientist which indeed he wanted to be a scientist um, and he has he wears this um, his uniform and there's a suit that um, that uh, is at the cleaners now at the end of the play uh, he hands her the suit and I think, can't remember precisely, but it says, the implication is, shall I wear this? And she says, don't bother. Just two words, don't bother. And I said, look, um, this is clearly capable of many different readings, but certainly two very contrasting readings. You could say, don't bother, meaning... Um, play it cynically like don't bother you know don't give me that stuff about you know the suit or whatever or you could play it generously saying don't bother meaning you don't need to anymore after what's happened in this this evening you don't need to do this and he said it's it's positive it has to be a positive affirmation because the play's got hope and and so a lot of playwrights would kind of try to mystify their work you know if I'd have told if I'd have known I'd have told or whatever that kind of stuff he was always so so clear about this is what I intended and this is what the play not that you kind of were trapped in it was never a trap it was like a massive release because it I'll give you another example of that with Bob Peck I mean during rehearsal of uh, at a later stage and um, I remember him saying to Bob, um, and he got to the point because he started trusting us in real, so that he could be very direct. And I think also because he was getting on, although luckily, thankfully, he had at least ten more years to live after this. But he was in his seventies, and I think he probably thought it's not time to waste. You know, you may be straightforward. And I remember him saying to Bob, "Bob," he said, "I get the impression, Bob, you're playing with a guy like he's a manipulator. It seems manipulative to me. It's, it's not a manipulator, no." He wa- he loves his brother. He wants to, and again, things like that, just being able to be so. And what was so helpful? I know that it would have taken me quite a lot of persuading Bob that there is no manipulation in this. This is on the level. And who am I to tell any actor this is definitely the case? You know, then I, you know Bob's an intelligent man. He he might have said, no, it's not. It must be. But when the player says. It's not manipulative. It's true. Like another thing he said to me many years later about Broken Glass. He was talking about an American production that he was having a little bit of trouble with in rehearsal. Um, and he said to me, I don't want to say this act here. I said to him the other day, um, what's the problem? He's a doctor. He likes healing people. And again, that kind of pithy response to his own work, from my point of view, director, was fantastically enriching, encouraging and helpful because as we know people go all round of the houses in plays when they're acting and, and directing and whatever missing the obvious and most of the time what directing is about is actually just to play what actually is it's about not play some other stuff you'd like it to be about now anyway so so the day after this run through luckily in those days I don't know whether the, the young Vic has the luxury now to do this but we used to have a week between productions a technical week in which the set was got on and so it was possible to rehearse on the set and to have at least three days rehearsal on the set and so I said it's great you've come at the perfect time because now what I'm going to be doing is going to be rehearsing through the whole play and it'll take about three days on the set would you be up for that you fancy that you fancy being there for the whole process he said, well, if, it, if you don't mind, that would be great. So um, so the next morning, 10 o'clock, he would call, and the same thing happened again. He sat very deferentially, a couple of seats back, whilst we got on to play. And I said, no, look, Arthur, the way I work is this. Look, I break play down into units. I hadn't really described my rehearsal method before, but units of action in the course of rehearsal. So break it into smaller and smaller, digestible parts really it's sort of method um, pioneered by Stanislavski which I've kind of adopted in my own way and as a lot of directors do um, and I said so what we'll do 
is we'll play a unit at a time and then we'll analyze that, talk about it and rehearse that. Is that okay? And, and, and then go on to the next one. He said, that's great, sounds great to me. So we played the first five minutes, which is like the first unit, really, the major unit, first five minutes. And the, the actors played it through. And then I turned to him and he looked at me and said, oh, come on, what are you gonna say now? And I said, no, no, tell us what you, what you think. And he stepped onto the stage and started to talk about it. And then we all had the most fantastic, it was like a kind of wonderful masterclass, really, where he was in an utterly collaborative way, collaborating with us. So it was, and it wasn't like he told us how to do it, but we could have the, de the de debate, the discussion, the, all the stuff that you'd have in rehearsal with this great, great artist there and I very often say, well, I haven't thought of it like that, but yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah, it's, de yeah, it's better if you do that, let's do that. And it was just such a joy and privilege to, to be able to work with him in that kind of utterly direct way. And he's written lots of lovely things about the young Vic, and he, oh, he, he, was get, he used to get tired a lot of the time. And um, there was one particular dressing room that we made, we got to put it in a, a bed for him. And I've often thought, that the best kind of tribute to Arthur Miller would be to just have a plaque on the dressing room that Arthur Miller used to rest here when he was rehearsing plays or so because he wouldn't want some great fuss made of it but to me it's, it'd always go off have his little rest have his little sleep and then come back and over lunch or whatever but that was just the most wonderful period of work and then because by so by now therefore He'd seen An Enemy of the People, he'd seen it in production, we collaborated over the telephone, he'd then been in rehearsal for Two Way Mirror, he then saw, rehearsed the price and saw that through to the opening night, and then he had to fly back to the States. So those three experiences then really created this relationship, which reached its, I won't take you through all the stages, but the Young Vic part of my relationship with him culminated in when um, he sent me, um, the last Yankee and said hey I think you might like to do this play and um, have a look at it see what you think it has never been done it's going to be done in the States but it's never been done what do you think and you can imagine my delight for a number of reasons when I saw it's got four actors <laughs> I thought well, this sounds like this could be quite commercial this is well and and it was a wonderful wonderful play wonderful wonderful play and um, uh, I said, we'd love to do it, and we'd love to do it, and it, as things turned out, was my last production at the Young Vic, The Last Yankee, and it was a delight to uh, The cast were um, Peter Davison and Zoe Wanamaker, and um, um, David Healy, who has well, sadly um, died, um, since um and he played he he worked a lot at the national he's an american actor worked a lot at, at, at the national and um not hilda burns but her name i can't remember her christian name you have to forgive me if you're listening to this but um anyway she was be lovely beautiful actor played played the other part in it and um it was very successful, um, and uh, it was actually the most, took, more people came to see it than any play that I'd ever directed at the Young Vic, which was a lovely way to, to go out, I have to say. And um, then um, we decided to extend it and um, to transfer it to the West End. And a person who was a great advocate of um, Arthur's work, an American producer and his wife, Frank and Woji Jero, beautiful, lovely people and great characters, they said they'd like to extend, to trans transfer this. But Zoe Wanamaker um, wasn't available either to extend the run or to transfer it. And Arthur, who by this time had become very good friends with my wife, Margot Lester, who had been in a number of his plays he said well you should get uh, Margot to play why don't you get Margot to play and I said well not sure that um, 
it should, should be available or but anyway I, I but and and luckily because we needed an actress who would just rehearse over a weekend because of the way it worked out when we were when we were going to extend the run and so he said I'll come over I'll come over I'll come over and I'll see I'll see the last night with the uh, Zoe Wanamaker and then I'll spend the weekend rehearsing with you and 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 and, and Margot you can rehearse her in and then I'll see it open with her and um so poor Margot had to rehearse this entire play on a Saturday and Sunday with me and Arthur, Arthur, not that that threatened her, but the reason I say poor Margot, well, it's bad enough having to rehearse the whole play in two days, but, but, but also Channel 4 decided they wanted to do a documentary on this. So the ca television cameras were on her for two days while we rehearsed this thing. So then it played for the, for the, the extended run for three weeks, then it transferred to the West End, and then also became um, the longest ever at the time, I don't know whether it still is, but at the time, the longest ever run of an Arthur Miller play um, in the West End. So um, bringing my utterly delightful 10 years nearly at the Young Vet to a conclusion with that event was as good as I could hope for really. So I was able to leave the Young Vic with nothing other than entirely delightful thoughts and memories. And as you can see, Arthur was central to that whole period of my life for which I will always be profoundly grateful. Whatever else happens to me ever in my life, either personally or professionally, that will be, I think, the thing that I tre uh, treasure above all else. <laughs>